This is Robin. Can you hear me? I can hear you loud and clear, Robin. Excellent. Patty, could you let us know if we're ready to kick things off? I think we are all set. Awesome. Awesome. Very glad. All right. Well, thank you guys. Thank you everyone for joining us here today. Um, I think that we are here to discuss what is a really important topic. And I think it's important on really two major levels. I think there's a personal level here and a societal level. I think on the personal level, what makes this topic so important is that we're, you're all young people with hopes and dreams. You want to get into medical school. You want to serve. Uh, you want to be able to make a big impact on society. And right now, given this COVID-19 situation, you have some unique hurdles, some really unique hurdles that previous medical students haven't had to go through. And I think the second reason that this information is really important, the really societal reason, is what we're all up against collectively is potentially a really big disruption of our physician pipeline here. Come the fall, we actually don't know uh, how many universities are, are going to be having in-person classes. We don't know what medical schools are going to be able to do about in-person clinicals, which are currently shut down. And so um, what we're really up against, the problem that we need to solve for collectively, is how do we get young people like you trained and into medical school so that we don't have that societal interruption? And so uh, I think what we have to accomplish here today is quite important. Um, so over the course of about the next hour plus, folks, what you're really going to hear about from this panel of experts is the major hurdles that are unique to this time for you students trying to get into medical school. And you're going to hear from these experts on what you can do to overcome those hurdles. Uh, a little bit about the panelists we have today uh, is that they are all joined together as members of the Tiber Network. And really what the Tiber Network is, is that it is a collection of of what I'd really say are progressively minded health science universities who are joined together in their mission uh, to try to drive greater socioeconomic diversity into medical schools. Uh, and the way that this, this network of, of universities does that is, which is through what's called the Tiber MSMS program, uh, which is a really, I think it's quite a unique program and um, path-breaking program truly in how they evaluate students. And so if all of you are interested in medical school, you're already quite familiar with the focus on MCAT and undergraduate GPA. Uh, but who you have in front of you today is a group of experts uh, that believes what makes a good physician is well beyond those numbers. And so the way that all of these partners here really manage their MSMS program is through advanced analytics, where you as a student can come in, you can work with your classmates, answer questions, uh, answer questions online and have all of those answers really run through a back-end analytics engine that helps predict uh, whether or not you would be successful in medical school. So the group of folks that you have in front of you today is committed to the idea of being able to tell students, hey student, you might have had a tough time in your freshman year. Hey student, you might have worked through all of your undergrad. And for, for those reasons and potentially others, maybe the grades or the MCAT wasn't, wasn't really predictive of what you're capable of. But this is a group of people that you're about to speak to that is very much about looking past that and creating opportunities for students uh, who otherwise would not be able to, to matriculate to a medical school. So excited for you guys to be able to hear from them. Uh, the expert that's gonna guide you through this, this discussion uh, along with our panelists uh, is a gentleman that you'll see in the top left-hand corner of your screen, uh, a gentleman named Dr. David Lenahan. Uh, Dr. Lenahan is a career uh, academic and innovator. Uh, he was formerly the Dean of Toro College of Osteopathic Medicine in New York, um, one of the largest osteopathic medical schools uh, in the United States, one of the largest medical schools in the United States. Um, and currently he is the uh, president of Tiber Health, um, the CEO of Tiber Health and the president of Ponce Health Sciences University, uh, which is the largest medical school in Puerto Rico. Uh, so in a moment here, I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Lenahan to introduce you to the rest of the panelists. Uh, but before I do so, um, I'd like to do two things. I'd like to tell you a little bit more about Dr. Lenahan's background and why he's truly an expert that can help you guide, guide through this issue. And then two, I uh, want to tell you a little bit about how this program is going to be run 
um, administratively so that we can interact with you guys all appropriately. Uh, in terms of Dr. Lenahan's background, we all at CyberHealth uh, joke that we're hoping for him uh, to, to stop the career student that he's always been. Dr. Lenahan uh, has a PhD in neurology from the University of Edinburgh, uh, also has an MBA from the University of Cambridge. Uh, for fun, while he was the Dean of Toro College of Osteopathic Medicine, completed his law degree part-time, uh, and he's actually, I believe, got two or three other degrees that I'm, I'm, uh, I'm missing here. But ultimately, Dr. Lenahan is someone who's dedicated his career not only to being a student himself, but creating opportunities for students um, who often have been failed by their traditional higher education system. And so I'll turn it over to Dr. Lenahan here. And the last point that I'll leave all of you here with uh, on the line with me today is that uh, throughout this conversation, we want to make sure that we deliver to you the most relevant information. So as our panelists are speaking, if you have follow-up questions, uh, if you have places you need them to clarify, please place your questions in the text box. And at the end of this conversation, uh, uh, we'll circle back to those questions and get those questions answered here by our panel of experts. Uh, so without any further delay, I'd like to go ahead and turn it over to Dr. Lenahan. Uh, Dr. Lenahan, would you please like to introduce yourself and the rest of the panelists, please? Thanks, Samir. And thank you everyone for showing up. I wanna just make a, a quick little announcement here. Let everyone know that this is being recorded and, and so that we can let other people see it later if, if they aren't able to come in. Truly amazed at the response we got. I mean, my phone was dinging all week for people wanting to, to come in and listen to this. And I think what that shows is the demand that's actually out there for people trying to figure out what to do. And so we're gonna to get to the panelists and go through some questions, a little bit about me. As Samir gave you a history of what I've done, my whole career has really been about health education. How do we get and employ more health workers? And more importantly, how do we create opportunities? I've noticed through my career that there's been shortages of healthcare workforce in urban and rural parts of America. And it seems that we don't have a method of selecting students from those areas that works very well. And we saddle students with large sums of debt and we have to figure out a way to solve that, to, to not only to solve the healthcare crisis here in the United States, but globally. And it's becoming more pervasive and more focused given what's going on today. And, and the fact, the reason why we're holding this, this conference. And so what we thought we would do at Tiber is we'd get some experts around the globe, uh, around the United States to come in and, and, and let's talk about these things. Let, let's kind of discuss it, try to give you that student some advice on, on what to do. And, and there's a lot of things to do and a lot of things to navigate that I didn't have to do when I was your age and students didn't have to do last year. So with that, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna introduce each member of our panelists. I'm gonna ask them to just give us a brief summary of you know, who they are and what they do. And, and so there's four of them and I'm just gonna introduce Dr. Dobbins. We'll do an alphabetical order. Uh, Dr. Ken Dobbins is the chancellor at Ponce Health Sciences University in St. Louis and is my, works with me across the desk. So Ken, if you wanna say a few words about yourself. Thanks, David, and thanks for allowing me to be part of this webinar. A little bit about my academic background. I have a bachelor's degree in accounting, CPA certificate in Ohio, MBA from Old Dominion, and PhD in higher ed administration from Kent State University. I've been in higher education for over 35 years, 10 years at Kent State University as assistant treasurer, uh, 24 years at Southeast Missouri State University, eight as executive vice president and 16 as, as president, and over two years as chancellor of Ponce Health, Health Science University uh, in St. Louis. This really is an exciting time in medical education, and it's great to be here in St. Louis, um, where David announced not too many weeks ago that Tiber Health is investing more than $80 million into an education um, facility here uh, in St. Louis uh, that will house not only our MSMS program, our PsyD program, but a satellite campus uh, of the med school from Ponce. So this is a great time to be in medical education and I, I really enjoy being here. Thanks, Ken, I appreciate that. Up next, we're gonna have Dr. Luis Fernandez Torres. He's from Miami at St. Thomas University. So Dr. Torres, you wanna give us a little bit about yourself? 
Thank you, uh, Dr. Linehan. Uh, so my name is Luis Fernandez, uh, Luis Fernandez Torres. I am the uh, academic dean, currently the academic dean at St. Thomas University in, uh, in Miami Gardens specifically, but Miami, South Florida area. Uh, I've been at St. Thomas for about eight years. Uh, I am a, a chemist by training, a physical chemist by training. So a virus is something that it's not even, an, well, it's not alive. It's, it's a material actually, it's like a polymer. Uh, and um, I've been in the higher education field uh, for about 15 years now. And um, I am, uh, it's a really exciting time uh, we, regarding medical education. I think the world is appreciating health education uh, now a lot these days uh uh due to the ongoing situations and i think these uh programs and uh, what we're going to talk about today are going to be uh really exciting uh for all the participants here uh a little bit more me i am a chemist by training um uh my uh phd is from the university of houston in texas uh i have a master's from the university of puerto rico at uh, mayaguez and then i have my bachelor's out of uh, chemistry out of penn state uh, university, uh, native of Puerto Rico, but I've been in the United States for about 30 years now. So thank Great. you. Uh, for Thanks, Dr. Torres. I appreciate that. At, at the end of this, we're gonna have to figure out how we can buy some of the shirts behind you. They look great. The baseball shirts. I'll, right I'll put the link on the chat box there <laughs> so everybody can go there. <laughs> Thanks. Next, we have Dr. Michael Rancheron. Mike is Dr. Rancheron, is from Southern California University School of Health Sciences. So Dr. Intern, you wanna just give us a little brief history of yourself? Sure, thank you, Dr. Lanahan, and good morning to everyone from Southern California. Uh, nice, sunny Southern California. Um, I just uh, wanted to say thank you for the invitation. Thank you for the opportunity to uh, uh, speak to the students and also give them our perspective and feedback in higher education. Myself, I've been in higher ed for over 15 years. I have three doctorate degrees, one in medicine, one in chiropractic, and one in education. And then I have a master's degree in public health, uh, specifically in the area of, in, ironically, infectious disease. <laughs> so um, uh, I've been uh, practiced physical medicine and rehabilitation medicine for about 15 years. Uh, higher ed, 15, worked my way up the food chain. Currently, I'm serving as the uh, assistant provost uh, for um, uh, professional studies and academic initiatives, as well as the dean for the College of Science and Integrative Health. And my number one charge is to make students successful. Beautiful. And that's why I'm here. And I've dedicated my life to uh, higher education, to medical education. And at the end of the day, your success is my success and our success. That's a great thank you. Thank you. Th thanks, Dr. Intern. That, that was a great statement. Next up, we have Dr. Robin Tylarzim, and she's from my hometown in Chicago at St. Xavier University. So, uh, Dr. Tylarzim, do you want to give us a little bit about yourself? Sure. Thank you, Dr. Linehan. Um, I'm Robin Riley Sam. Hello from snowy Chicago. I think I'm the only snow. one who has <laughs> snow on the ground today. I know. It's ridiculous. Um, but you, you folks should consider our program anyway, even though there's snow on the ground in April. <laughs> um, I am Dean of Arts and Sciences at St. Xavier University. I clearly have the fewest degrees of anyone on this panel. I only have a PhD from Northwestern in Molecular Biology and Genetics. Um, but I've worked, uh, before I went into higher ed, I worked in rational drug design uh, to, to do the basic science behind drug development, which is also clearly in the news these days. Um, I've been in higher education for 20 years, and I think one of the real joys of my career has been mentoring pre-health students and walking with them through their journey as undergraduates and, and in those gap years as well, continuing that relationship and helping them get into medical schools and dental schools and, and you know, recently reconnecting with so many of those graduates from my classes and from my research lab who are on the front lines right now. So um, I have seen so many great stories through the years of students who started slowly as undergraduates and just really turned it around and are fabulous physicians now. And um, it's really a joy to, to partner with Tyburn with these other schools in helping more students make it through that pathway. And um, whether you started slow or whether you started gangbusters, um, to, to help you discern what that 
that journey is for you educationally and how you can serve society uh, through healthcare. So I'm really pleased to join you this morning. Thanks, Dr. Tyler. Appreciate that. So a little bit about me also, I've been Dean of a medical school. So I've seen this process of from the other side. So I'm looking at a little bit more from the medical school side and kind of how that process is going to change over the next, geez, two days over the next just few days. So a couple of things I kind of want to go through is this is a very stressful time applying to medical school, going through and doing the MCAT, making sure you get good grades. The most important thing I can tell a student is to make sure that you actually take care of yourself that this is a very stressful time. There is lots of pressures placed on you, probably from your family, on yourself. I know most of you are A-type personalities, like all of us on this panel, and you know, you're a go-getter. You still need to make sure you eat right. You still need to make sure you get exercise. And you, if, you, if you're feeling stressed because of you're being locked in the house because of COVID-19 or worked up about the MCATs or, or getting good grades, make sure you get some help, some counseling help. There's no shame in any of that. I do a lot with public health. I do a lot with uh, psychological services, and this is very important. So at the end of this uh, presentation, we're gonna have a link of somebody that you can call if, if things could get a little bit out of whack. And if you just call them if you feel funky, just don't let that fester and become too large. The second thing is because there's a lot of stress going on, a lot of uncertainty around the world of what's gonna happen, make sure you're careful with your information that you collect. I've seen recently on Twitter that they've announced that the NCAT is going to be postponed until June 20 or June 17th. That's not correct. If you go to the AAMC website, they say that they'll announce information on May 21st. No one's got any extra information outside of that. Be careful with what you read. Go to the source. Go to the AAMC.org. At the very top, it's got a thing that says coronavirus. Click here for about the MCATs. If you're curious about medical school, go to the LCME website. Go to the medical school that you're applying to, but get the information from that source. Just don't use Twitter or Instagram or Snapchat as your main media gathering site. That will elevate your stress levels and won't help you at all. The second thing I want to say, which kind of relates to making sure you get your information correctly, is be careful that you're aware of what the school, the medical school you want to go to, if they've changed their policies at all. A lot of the undergraduate schools in the United States, because of what's going on and because we're teaching in different modalities, is moving to pass-fail grades. Some of the medical schools have said, if you're given a choice between a pass-fail grade and a marked grade, if you choose the pass-fail grade, they will not count that as a grade or credit. So if you want to go to school X, make sure before you decide to take the course as pass fail, that you make sure that that's going to pass muster for you where you want to go. Okay. What I would also say you should be aware of is the application process. Okay. Make sure that you've logged on to Comus and that you're started your application process and you're kind of moving through just the hurdles. You got time right now. You're at home. Get on the internet, you're listening to me after this, get on and, and start that application process. You don't have to have all the stuff there, but you can start working through some of the roadblocks you might experience. Now kind of comes down to what are we talking about here? What in the world are you going to do this year? A lot of us have, a lot of you have had your MCATs postponed, you're unsure of how you're going to go through that application process. So you, I really think you've got kind of four or five choices out there. The first one is you can do nothing. As I, 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 I say is Call of Duty and Minecraft are great games, but they don't look great on a medical school application if you take the, the year off and, and, and build a great city in Minecraft or become number one at Call of Duty, but it's not gonna really, really help you that much. The second thing I guess you could do is you could go do some clinicals, which does look good on your, on your CV and your application process. You're out there working with the doctors, you're out there seeing patients. The problem with that right now is that's probably gonna be relatively limited. And the reason is, is the AAMC, which controls the medical schools, are not allowing the medical schools right now to send their students into the hospitals, into the clinics to treat patients. And it's because there's not a sufficient amount of personal protective equipment, PPE. And owing to that reason, 
there's probably a limited amount of clinical experience you're going to be able to acquire at least for the next three or four months. And, and, and so you got to be aware that that's, that could be out there come September, October time, but you'll have to make some decisions before then. The same thing applies to research. A lot of, I, I hear this probably most, I want to take a year out and go do some research. Fabulous. I got a PhD. I like research as much as the next person. But again, you have to be somewhat realistic in the labs, have their postdocs, they have their PhD students they're trying to deal with. And to have an intern come in, especially when they're not sure what the work environment's like, can be quite difficult. And so if you want to do clinical or research or something in that, just be aware that there's going to be some extra hurdles that students might not have had to deal with in previous years. The next thing that I think is really why a lot of you have, have logged on is, well, what if you want to improve your academic record? What if you want to kind of say, hey, I didn't do very well freshman or sophomore year. I got some, you know, a couple C's and I didn't, I didn't really get a grasp or now I'm a little bit more older and I need to kind of shore up and get better prepared to go to medical school. You got two choices there. You can either go do a post bac or you can get a master's degree. The post bac is usually an offered degree from a university that has a medical school where the student goes there and if they do okay in it, they can go into that medical school. The problem with that degree is that if you don't do well or you do mediocre and you could probably get into another medical school but not the one you're going to, it's kind of a lost year. And so we're gonna talk about, uh, we got some questions on there and talk about what to do on, on that scenario. The other thing is what we, what we offer and that's a master's degree and what the master's degree is, is it's really the first year of medical school. And what we do and what, what all these partners that are here with us, what we do collectively is we run the students through the first year of medical school. And then we're able to aggregate your scores together and predict how you would do if you were a medical student in respects to the boards, how you would do in specific classes. We can then tailor everything to you based on your skill sets. The advantage of the master's degree over the post -bac is that when you graduate, should you not go to medical school, should you not go to a health profession degree, you have a degree you can go do something with. A post -bac doesn't allow you to become a STEM teacher or anything like that, where a master's degree actually allows you to go on and do something else or use it as a, a credit towards other courses or towards you know, other degree programs. And the nice thing about the Tiber network, the reason why we got all everyone here is from California to Chicago, to Miami, to St. Louis, to Puerto Rico, we actually have a collection of schools and in New Jersey soon, a collection of schools running this that can then take you into their program and, and, and run you through and help you to, to acquire a, a degree process. And what I mean by that is some of the students will go to medical school, some of the students, if you don't get into medical school, you can go to dentistry, you can go to pharmacy, you can go to chiropractic, you can go to osteopathic, optometry. There's a whole discipline of health out there that is massively short in workers. And these are great jobs, by the way. These are good paying jobs, they're career jobs, they, 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 you know, they, they're gonna provide for your family. And so I want you to understand that there's an opportunity out there for all of you. And what we're trying to do through this program and through this seminar here, is how do we get you to understand that opportunity, get you in the right path so that you can get that opportunity. And so this really what it's all about. If you, if you like anything that one of us says, you can reach out to any of us. I, I know that at the end, there's gonna be some emails and, and information for people to use, to contact out. So we're gonna start right out. I'm gonna jump right into it. I'm gonna ask Dr. Richaran from Southern Cal. Um, how will the COVID-19 change the medical school landscape? Sure. Thanks, Dr. Linehan. Um, COVID, as we have visually, has visually demonstrated a disruption to the healthcare worker pipeline and a huge shortage of qualified physicians, which ultimately positions you, students here on this call, to fill that much needed void, especially in rural settings. My experience as a physician, it's those rural hospitals that are in critical need of primary care services. Uh, to provide care to the underserved communities. With the MSMS degree, it can position you to earn that competitive seat in medical school and get you on that trajectory to fill those medical need gaps and provide access to medical care. Uh, a recent article in John Hopkins noted that uh, as the doctor shortage continues, residency programs uh, 
show success specifically at graduating uh, more primary care physicians. And according to the National Registry for Resident Matching, uh, it was up in 2020, about almost 14% for primary care. So again, at the end of the day, what does this mean? With this map, what does this mean is that one, it's about filling a void. Two, it's about having a calling. And three, it's about earning a degree that can better position you to succeed, hence our MSMS program. And, and, and so, Doctor, do you see this program taking students? One, one of the things I like about the program is a lot of the students that come in are often from rural and urban areas, two mm -hmm. places we have dramatic shortages of healthcare workers. Do you see them going back into those areas and practicing and, and, being, and maybe they should discuss that on their application process? I was just going to say, I would hope that would be something on their uh, reflection statements that really would attract me for selecting that candidate. Because ultimately, we need to fill those gaps and that individual that wants to serve their communities that have a deficiency, I think that's critical in this day and age. Great. All right, so moving on, we're going to ask Dr. Dobbins. Outside of COVID-19, what challenges are facing students right now to prepare for entry into medical school? There are several, Dr. Lenihan. Let me, let me talk a little bit about it. them. First, uh, spring semester 2020 grades, and you mentioned that a little bit earlier. Uh, many universities aren't assigning the letter grades, uh, pass, fail, credit, non-credit. So that creates a problem in that how do you calculate GPAs for science courses or how do you calculate GPAs for uh, overall GPA. Um, in the past, uh, at, at Ponce St. Louis, our admissions to the MSMS program said we needed to have a 2.7 GPA and, and take the MCAT. Didn't matter what your score was, but to take it. Um, so far as G, uh, GPA students, some students just didn't do well the first several years. So what we've decided to do is that we're not requiring the MCAT. Um, and we're also uh, looking at individuals if they have pass fail or, or credit non-credit, looking at what they've done in the last two to three, three semesters. Um, because as you, if we see a, a positive trend in their, uh, in their GPA, uh, we're going to accept them on a conditional uh, admit uh, and work with them to make sure they're successful. Um, well, one, of things I, one of the things I heard you say, Ken, is that um, not requiring the MCAT, that's to get into our master's program. So the program is helping you get prepared for taking that MCAT. Is that correct? And doing a better job uh, when you do take the MCAT. Right. Um, and one of the other things I think, if I was a student wanting to go to med in, in the med school for fall of 2020, you should be asking a couple questions like, uh, if the COVID pan pandemic uh, uh, continues, how will my academic programs be delivered and will it be a quality program? Um, you know, as we've talked, our MSMS program uses a flipped classroom approach. Uh, whether we teach, uh, our faculty teach the, the courses uh, in St. Louis and face-to-face -face or in California or Miami or Chicago or New Jersey, um, we have in-class sessions that uh, we will, in fact, make sure the students understand the concepts that, that they will have, uh, have to deal with in medical school. Uh, all of our lectures are pre-recorded. They look at those pre-recorded lectures, and then we make sure that they're understanding the underlying medical techniques and, and concepts. Um, when we had to move to a uh, a protective state, our face-to-face -face classes, um, our faculty already knew how to do Zoom, uh, Zoom classes because we're doing it to in Chicago and in Miami. Um, right. so it was very easy for us to go from a face-to-face -to, -face to basically an online without, it was a seamless transition without any issues with the quality. Uh, so we believe that this is this is one thing that we can offer uh, because we just don't know what's gonna happen in fall of 2020. One of the things I, I like about the program we're offering collectively is that because it's the first year of medical school, we're actually preparing the student when they go to medical school. One of the things as having been a Dean and a professor is the students really get tripped up 
in, in Dr. Rancheran's uh, program, like biochemistry or the chemistry courses really kind of mess up that student in anatomy. If they can get some foundation before they go to medical school, that gives them the ability to keep up. And what we find with the students that are coming into this program is they often didn't do well freshman year. And so they didn't get that foundation in chemistry and biology that was as solid. This gives the students an ability to catch up, get that foundation. And I will tell you that most of the students that come out of this program and go into medical school are, are the top performers. And it's because they have that foundation already prepared. So Dr. Alarzam, um, what should students be thinking about when planning their course to medical school with this disruption? What, what should be going through their heads? Yeah, I think that in many ways, this is the perfect time to go back to basics, go back to your foundations and take some time to reflect. Um, what are your strengths? Where do you have opportunities to grow? Um, why do you wanna practice medicine? That's a really important question. And right now you have time. Um, well, you may have time. I shouldn't <laughs> assume that you have time, but, but there's uh, been a disruption in your regular life. And so you have the opportunity to, to take some time and think about you know, what really are your core values and how does that relate to practicing healthcare? Um, it's a great time, I think, to polish a personal statement and to ask mentors to read it through and, and um, help you make it even better. I think it's a great time to structure some MCAT prep. And if you wanted to do that through a program like an MSMS, that would be a, a good compliment, I think. Um, I think it's also time, you know, Dr. Lenahan talked about how difficult it's going to be to get clinical hours in for observations, but I think there's definitely opportunities right now to show that you care about your community and you're, you're someone who gives back to your community. I think about all the kids who are home from school right now and all the parents who are just at sea with helping them with math and science. Can you reach out to your local high school or your local middle school and say, hey, I know STEM. Is there someone who needs a little tutoring on the side and do that as a volunteer opportunity? It'll That's develop your communication skills too. Yeah. But I think that just taking some time to reflect is important. What, one of the things I often tell students is, I, I think one of the things I want to kind of expand a little bit, Dr. Lesdam, is that personal statement. Yeah. Just don't write it once, have someone read it and be done. You modify it over time, right? Absolutely. Um, you want that to really reflect who you are and you want it to portray your values, but you also want it to be really tight and well written and um, and compelling to the readers. You know, they're going to read a lot of personal statements. I'll tell you, I've read a lot of those statements and unless they catch me in that first paragraph, unless it's properly written, I'm kind of like, yeah, all right. And I go off and, you know, I got thousands of these things to read. So you right. want to make sure you've got it, like you said, nice and tight, well written and describe who you are. Yes, absolutely. And there are lots of people in your life who can help you with that. Yeah. So um, for me, I really love the idea of helping out at the high school. I, I never like you, you told me that yesterday. I never thought of that. But that's a great idea. I mean, that, that does show you care. It's, it's wonderful. And I think all of us know that you never really learn something until you have to teach it. <laughs> so um, that's another way to reinforce your own learning. Very good. Moving on, Dr. Torres, stress is a, a, a major prospect for medical students, and it's even more stressful for students trying to apply to medical school. How do you think a, a master's degree can help students through this, or how can it help them get through this? I think Dr. Torres might be on mute. Now, yeah, the, uh, uh, now I'm on, on mute. All right, stress level and, uh, a medical uh, school application. Um, that is uh, certainly always a factor. Uh, one of the big things that we see is sometimes students when they're going to the process of getting that application or just a thought of going towards medical school, you know, they they go to their parents, I mean, or their loved ones, because there's kind of, that's kind of their support system. And uh, they don't know. They, they unless they were doctors, they really don't know what the process is or what it entails. So that's where they gravitate towards their professors. Now, how do we come in? We can certainly, you know, guide them through the process, work things such as that statement to continuously revise it and, and do all the steps, do your shadowing, do your clinicals, get good grades. Um, 
but in the end, um, it, it, it's still a stressful period. I mean, you are, it's a very competitive application. You know, not everybody goes to medical school, you know, and uh, a program like an MSMS, I see it, it has a, a great advantage because you discover two things. You discover, yes, I like this. This is really what I want to do. I had a vocation. Or you discover, you know what? I great knowledge. I have a great background now. Medical school is not for me. I mean, and that right there is extremely powerful because you have certainty. And right. that's one of the things that will relieve a lot of the stress. And you have to think of the investment that is medical school, not only economic, but also emotionally and personally. So, you know, getting, you know, as always, the better information you have, the better decisions you can make. And I think, you know, the MSMS program really feels a, a, a great um, uncertainty that some people may have in that process of, should I do medical school? Should I not do it? Am I ready? Am I not ready? It really answers a, a, a number of questions there. One of, the, one of the things I really like about the program, Dr. Torres, if you can talk to this, is not, like you just said, not everyone goes to medical school. That's just the reality of life. But there are lots of health professions that are out there. And the program can help stratify that to decide where you might like to go. Do you want to become a dentist or a nurse practitioner or do something different? Correct. And the background knowledge uh, that you get in there, the biochemistry, the uh, anatomy, physiology, the micro, certainly uh, can translate to other fields that are related to healthcare. Uh, not only nursing, but you want to think of also the physical therapy aspect of it. You want to also think of it. even exercise and sports training. It's an area that does have a uh, need some of that background, and that's one thing. For example, in our area, in Miami, you know, everybody looks good. Everybody trains. That means there is a market for this. So there's certainly a a need in those areas right there, uh, along with you know, pharmacy school. Certainly is another area, uh, and there's other healthcare. Uh, professions that keep coming up and having that background in in health and having that master's is really, really useful. One area that this COVID-19 will prove very, very, uh, that is essential, it's the area of uh, demography and having the health knowledge to right. work the demography and the data analytics that are associated with it. So that's going to be a new opportunity that pe people maybe didn't think about it but that is gonna be right there available for, for the, the public now with the healthcare knowledge. So Dr. Rilarsdam, following on what Dr. Torres just said there, what partnerships has your university, St. Xavier University, developed so that students can go into medicine or go into other, other pathways? Sure, so we're really excited that this is our first year uh, offering the MSMS at St. Xavier. And in addition to the guaranteed interviews at Ponce, we have uh, guaranteed interview agreements with the Lake Erie College of Osteopathic Medicine in Erie, Pennsylvania, and with A.T. Still University in Kirksville, Missouri. And those, um, so students who achieve a certain grade point average and then a minimum MCAT score are guaranteed an early interview at those two institutions for their medical programs. But also, they're eligible for early interviews for dentistry and pharmacy at both of those schools. And I think, Ken, you also at, at, in St. Louis have a similar type of arrangement? We do with AT Still, uh, and also with the St. Louis uh, College of Pharmacy. Uh, we are building those relationships so that we can not only get our MSMS student graduates into those programs, but also the ability that we can have our students do, um, do, some, do some evaluations and also to, to uh, partner with them for uh, clinicals and things of that nature. So that's part of what we do. We have speakers come in from different uh, healthcare professions and talk to the, our students about um, their opportunities in other places. You know, uh, what are you going to do when you grow up? What are you going to do when you get your master's degree? And we're trying to help them not only shore up their academic credentials, but also to figure out what career they want to take in the health professions. I'm gonna come back to this point and let all four of you have a discussion, but I wanna to get to Dr. Torres here with one quick question. How does the rigor of the curriculum that we're offering through this program 
how does it resemble that first year of medical school? Right, so one of the main things is uh, the following. So at St. Thomas University, we, we have before our partnership with Ponce Health Sciences University through Tiber, we had a sort of similar program. We called it a master's in cell and molecular biology. Uh, so we had a good part of the content. The part that I could not recreate was the pace. The pace of medical school is the one area when students go in that, that blind science them completely. So pace is one area that I think has been the greatest uh, advantage the MSMS uh, has provided to the students. Also, l the rigor in terms of the content and I mean, you have professors that teach at medical schools. Therefore, they're not watering this down. They're doing the same thing, which has to be done. I mean, that's the only way you put a product forth that is realistic to right. those students, you know, and, and, and I'm very satisfied about that. And I've had uh, my faculty sitting in some of the courses and look at this and tell them, you know what, that is something we could not replicate and they're doing it. So I think that part right there is great. It's a great advantage that students get in here. So one of the things I really like about it, Dr. Torres, and, and the pace is really the whole point of this. Medical or health profession schools are not really difficult if it's one course at a time, but it's the volume of information that comes at you and you got to learn how to sift through it to figure out what you do and do not need. But that stratification of what you can do afterwards, even if you go do something else, you go into pharma sales, having that first year of medical school knowledge in your brain, understanding how biochemistry works, the Krebs cycle, or knowing where the biceps muscle is, or even some immunology stuff, that makes you a better worker and better prepared, more prepared to, to go into other programs or the workforce. Correct. And I think, uh, you know, one of the things I tell the students, it's like, you know, medical school may not be it. Uh, you know, we, you have to be frank with them, but you certainly have this knowledge that you can apply to other fields as new fields emerge, along with the classical fields that we have that are related to healthcare. And we know new fields will emerge. You know, we, we, there's a saying, we're training students now for careers that don't exist yet. So that's certainly one of the big advantages of, of having this knowledge that. and this rigor. I think I'm going to steal that statement, but write that down, right? Samir, write that down. <laughs> <laughs> Copyright it. Sorry. That's right. Copyright <laughs> that. That was awesome. Right. <laughs> so, uh, Dr. Rancheran? Uh, Dr. Lanigan, could I just chime in a little quickly on that last statement about rigor? It was interesting. For our accreditation application for the MSMS program, I had to demonstrate to our accrediting body here on the West Coast that the MSMS degree has the same rigor, has the similar, has the same program learning outcomes comparatively to five other medical schools. And I compared them to Duke, Loma Linda, Stanford, UCLA, and Kaiser Permanente. And when we looked at the rigor of those program learning outcomes and the ACGME competencies, core competencies for medical students, everything matched in all of these high level institutions. It's which because it is a medical curriculum. It's the, yep. It literally is the same as first year. Yep. And, and that's exactly it. The rigor was there. And when I even broke it down to the core curricula comparatively across these five medical school programs, the MSMS, uh, those five medical school programs, core courses composed of about 94% of courses related to the MSMS degree. So again, that rigor is there. And that's why these students, when they go from the MSMS program into medical school or other health professions, they're well ahead of the game past everybody else. And what that allows the student to do is because they're a little bit ahead, it allows them to really get into that material and, and get that understanding built in. And so that, that's why they perform better. They do better on the boards when they take them in their professional degree programs. And so far out of a few hundred students that we've had go from the master's program into medical school, I think it's well over a couple hundred, None of, them have, none of them have failed the boards. And it's because they have that. And again, I want you to all to understand, these are students that did not get into medical school. If you would have got into medical school, you're probably not listening to us, although I think you should, but you're probably not. 
<laughs> so you're all a bunch of uh, uh, students who didn't get in. And what we're saying is if you do this program and get in, we're going to be able to tell you, you've got a, a super high probability to pass the boards and get that residency and job that you want. And that's why it's so important. I wanted to ask you, Dr. Richardson, since you're on the screen there, what made you guys at Southern Cal decide to offer the MSMS student to your students? Yeah, great question. Well, ultimately for us, it was about diversifying our degree programs on the campus. And uh, this was a great pathway for us uh, to provide a robust curricula for a student to continue their academic trajectory onto a health profession education. Uh, also, it allowed us to help that learner who wanted to strengthen their academic scores, improve their MCAT scores, uh, provide a competitive edge for that individual who's either applying or reapplying to medical school. So for us, it served as a multitude of pathways for a student to stay in our university pipeline and maybe go to chiropractic college, PA school, uh, but then also provide a mechanism for medical school. And when are you guys planning on starting? Uh, August 31st, 2020. Fantastic. That's awesome. Dr. Dobbins, how can applications with lower GPAs and MCAT scores still find a match into medical school? Well, just because you have a low GPA or a low MCAT doesn't mean that you can't be successful in med school. And that's why our MSMS program is, is designed to improve students' academic uh, credentials, prepare them for medical school admissions, and provide them options for medical school. So I, you know, we have an opportunity to those give the second chance to those individuals that didn't make it into med school the first time. You know, one of the things I wrote, I wrote a paper, Dr. Dobbins, in LinkedIn. If you, if you get a chance, go to my LinkedIn page. It's about baseball. And it compares baseball to the MCAT. And imagine if a baseball player only had one at bat to define his entire career. And th that's not baseball. The MCAT is that you get one test and that decides if you do or do not get into medical school. One, I'm not a big fan of that. Everyone on this, that on this panel knows that I, I write about the problems with that. But the thing with the, the master's program is because it's over a year and we're assessing you every second of every day, every time we ask you a question in class, every time you're in a lab, every time you take an exam, all that data is coming in and we're comparing you to students who are in medical school who have passed the boards. And so we're able to start building up predictive models and, and determining where your strengths and weaknesses are. And that's how we know that when you go to medical school or you go to some health profession school, that you're going to do very well in their boards because we're monitoring that day to day. Instead of having one at bat, you get a thousand at bats. And we're using that average to decide whether or not you should go into that, that school. And if you use the baseball analogy, I like baseball. the same thing when, uh, and it should be the St. Louis Cardinals, not the Cubs, right? <laughs> <laughs> but, but anyhow, uh, if you're not doing well, you have a batting coach. And because we give those tests every day and we give exams, we know when students need to be remediated and what they need to be remediated in. So that's really important. And, and you know, if, if you're a student that's listening uh, and you went to, to a, a community college for one, two years, probably it's gonna be difficult for you to get into the med school the first time. That, give, that is our opportunity to help you uh, prepare for your admissions packet uh, for med school. So I wanna, I wanna bring Dr. Larsdam back, back in here for a second because she's been coaching and mentoring students to get into, into medical school. I want you to talk about it, and I look back at myself when I was 18 years old and, and going into university and, and thinking about what I was gonna do in my life to when I was 23 years old and graduation and, and trying to decide it. Those are two different individuals in their lifespan. And I, I think sometimes just because you got a few C's freshman year at university should not dictate whether or not you get to go do a postgraduate healthcare degree. That's absolutely true. I can tell you so many great stories about kids who were just, they were not really all there when I taught them in freshman biology. So part of <laughs> my, my teaching mode has always been that first semester. But, um, you know, like I said, I've been reconnecting with medical students and, and residents and MDs, you know, practicing MDs now these last few weeks. And, and there are students who you never would have predicted were going to learn how to learn. 
and and that is I think for an educator the very best possible outcome I think that um, you know the kid who comes in polished at 18 and is disciplined and knows how to study they're gonna succeed but we can give you um, that leg up and we can actually contribute to your life if we can help you learn how to learn and learn how to structure yourself and find a way that you fit into society. I think that's one of the, a really, really exciting part of that. And this MSMS is part of that progression. So it's recognizing that lots of students figure out how to learn about the age of 20. Right. And now you can continue on that and have a great track record in that. So, so uh, uh, Dr. Achurin, what Dr. Larzam said something very interesting to me is that student that comes in at 18 is very polished. I'm not a big fan of the 4-0 students. The, the, the students that get straight A's and never do anything else. I would rather have a student that has a 3-4, 3-6 GPA, that played sports, did drama, was in the band. I don't care what else you did, but you did something else because I believe they make better doctors. What, what do you think, Dr. Chair? Well, I mean, for our physician assistant program, very similar criteria for medical school. Um, we ideally look for a well robust rounded individual. Uh, you know, do you play an instrument? Because that affects a certain part of the brain, helps with critical thinking. I mean, there's a variety of variables that we look at. GPA is one mechanism, but ultimately it's not the defining one to say, is this candidate gonna be successful in PA school and or medical school? But then also, you know, do you have the necessary communication skills? Are you, can you communicate effectively with a patient? Can you communicate effectively with your peers? Uh, are you, can you communicate effectively in small group discussions? Because that's part of the active learning educational experience. So there's a lot of variables that we look at, and I completely concur that GPA is not the only thing. And if I could add, we haven't really been talking about the rest of life either. The rest of life does come into what your GPA looks like. So are you contributing to your family's income? There are plenty of students who are, who are working many hours a week to put food on the table for their parents and their siblings or their grandparents. Yeah. Um, Especially with the students that we're talking about, people that come from the lower socioeconomic Absolutely, of America. right. Are, are, is your family, uh, are your family recent members of America? Right? Did you grow up learning a different language and now you're learning in a second language? Well, that's, that's actually not a disadvantage. That's a huge advantage in life. But, and let's honor that and, and show the, the breadth of you as a person. So we got, we got just a little bit left in time here. and We're gonna do some, some Q and A's. I have realized the flaw in setting up this process. I'm too far away from my screen to read the question. So I'm gonna ask Samir to come online and maybe read the questions and then I'll, I'll pass it along to the panelists. If Samir is still on. Otherwise I am, there you go. We're just waiting to get unmuted Dr. Lenahan. <laughs> so let's go ahead and turn ourselves over here to the question and answer session and very, uh, very thankful for how thoughtful these questions are in the text box. So I wanna get right to them. I think the first question we have, uh, I'd love to turn over to uh, to Robin here, uh, Dr. Reilers Dam. Um, and this question, uh, Dr. Reilers Dam, is really about the diversity in our MSMS program. And the students here would love to know both about socioeconomic diversity, racial diversity, but also diversity in terms of uh, undergraduate GPA and MCAT score. So could you tell us a little bit about what the student body looks like? Sure, at St. Xavier in Chicago, um, we, we started the, the program in the fall and over half of our students are underrepresented minorities in healthcare. So most of our students are not white middle class. Um, most of our students are coming from lower socioeconomic levels. Uh, their parents are blue collar. Um, they worked themselves through college. So um, it is, it's part of our institution's mission. It's definitely part of the mission of the MSMS at St. Xavier to make sure that um, we understand and, that, and we accept and we celebrate people from all different walks of life uh, because that's, that's part of making us a more just society and a better world. Um, your question about MCAT, we don't require an MCAT. If we like you to report one, if you've taken it, because that's a good benchmark that we can measure your growth against. Um, 
And then your GPAs, we accept GPAs uh, maybe a, about a 2.8 or higher. Um, we'll, we'll work with you on that too. And we definitely take a holistic view of, of where you were getting those lower grades and where you're getting those higher grades, whether it's in time or what, what classes they're in. So we, we want to look at you as a whole person. Thank you. That was exceptionally well put. I appreciate it. Right, Samir, uh, uh, if I could uh, also pitch in a little bit in there. Uh, not only, you know, the GPA, certainly I think all our programs will work on this, uh, but certainly in terms of the racially diverse aspect of the program, I think that's, you know, it, it's really part of the mission of this program. Uh, it's, you know, this is where, you know, Dr. Uh, Lenningham is really a big cheerleader in this area. He certainly uh, wants that and, not only want, we want that as a society, I think, and that's really what is going to enrich uh, the medical uh, uh, profession. And uh, if you bear with me um, uh, for a second, I'm going to switch languages here because this is what we do in Miami uh, and in Puerto Rico from time to time. Así que las personas que escuchan en español en San Thomas University también eh, nosotros podemos comunicarnos en español. Just like in Ponce, you can do, you know, you can communicate in Spanish. We can do this at, at St. Thomas University also, and it's really part of the richness of, of of the program, and it's really part of the purpose. Just having that that diversity, I think it just makes you a in the end a better healthcare professional. Dr. Torres, one of the things I, I I speak to the hospital associations in the United States quite a bit, and understanding different cultures when you treat patients, whether it be language or religion, really is, a, is an important aspect to these hospitals because that helps improve their patient outcomes, patient satisfaction, that improves their reimbursement, but it improves the quality of care they can give. I, I give an example of a patient that had a heart attack and the doctor walks in the room and the patient looks like me and it's probably just him and his wife. You walk down into a room in Miami or down in Ponce or San Juan, Puerto Rico, and there's 20 people in the room. Now, medically, what you do the same is the same. Do you do, you do a stent or give drugs or do surgery? But how you handle that in Puerto Rico, in Miami, you got to hug the patient. Maybe not now because of COVID-19 and social distancing. But before, you, you have to understand that interaction with that family dynamic. I'm an Irish Catholic boy from the Midwest. I don't want people touching me unless they have to. Right, I just, that's not part of my culture. Understanding those differences can have a major impact on the quality of care. And I think Dr. Richard, you wanna add a little bit onto that? Um, you know, down here at Southern California University, we have a very diverse uh, student body as well. And one of our missions and in, in, in our vision as well is to have a diverse student body so that across all of our disciplines at the university, because uh, we are preparing health professionals uh, in various disciplines so that they can go back to those communities that they serve. So that's critical. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Samir? Yes. Next question, I'd like to turn over to Dr. Dobbins. And Dr. Dobbins, this question is really about the application cycle. And so I'm hearing from some folks in the chat and in some private messages, uh, simply that um, this program might sound like a good fit to them, but they want to be realistic and say, hey, it is April. It is really late in the application process. Is this going to be a challenge for them to, uh, to submit their application and get enrolled and have a real shot at being able to matriculate this upcoming fall? Can, uh, That's not Samir's can... real voice, by the way. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, one of the things that we have been talking about is how we're, we give second chances to students that didn't make med school. Well, they don't figure out that they're not going to med school until med school tells them that. And that the big time, the big time to get those rejection letters are in uh, May, April, May, and in June. And so we can turn around an application within, within a week. Um, so I don't, I don't see that as an issue. I would suggest that, that uh, those that are listening would uh, Look at, look at the uh, slide that you're going to show and how to, how to contact us uh, and to start the application process. Because that's very important to start that because we have a few things that we need. Uh, obviously, uh, transcript and letters of recommendation and things of that nature, but it is not too late. In fact, it's the prime time right now to get ready to come to either South St. Louis or 
uh, one of our partners um, for the fall of 2020. What I would say is when we talked earlier on about the stress levels to the student, a lot of times helping to reduce those stress levels is taking that first step. So get, get your Acomus application for medical school or whatever professional school you want, get it going. So get, get the process going. Get, if, you're, if you're not sure, apply to the master's program, to any one of the schools that are here talking to you today. Because if you get accepted to med school, maybe you don't do the master's program. I still think you should do the master's program if you get in the med school just to get that preparation. But I understand if you don't. But get everything in order so you're not rushing at the last minute to do something. Start that process now. Um, I, I want to bring that back to Dr. Rolaro Sam because I know she deals with this all the time. I can just see in her face on the screen kind of smiling about it. So yeah. you want to just. Yeah, I was going to say it's not too late to start in June in, in Chicago if you want. So we, we can start a cohort. Um, you can join our program in June. You can join it in August. You can join it in January. Yeah, no, that's very good. Thank you for saying so, that. Yeah, my advice will be apply now. Just, yeah. just do it. I mean, apply now. We're ready to receive applications. So. Dr. Lenahan, I'd like to turn this next question over to you. I did receive a text recently that said, my voice sounds like Darth Vader. And <laughs> now I understand why everyone is laughing. Uh, and so, uh, I'll, I'll turn it over to you to answer this question as quick as I can, Dr. Lenahan. Uh, but the question that I'm seeing in the chat is really a group of questions that's focused on what this year's medical school application will, will look like or the application cycle will look like and what it'll look like next year. And specifically what folks are, are worried about is, one, are medical schools really going to be able to launch classes in the fall of 2020? And two, do you actually think that the application cycle in the fall of 2021 will be even more competitive because of the backlog of students? That's a great question. I think for the, the second part of the question is gonna be really difficult to answer. But I think for, for the things that are gonna be different this year, you're gonna to have to do distance interviews, kind of like what we're doing right now. That's gonna be a different event. I mean, it's, it's stressful going to do an interview, but when you're doing it face to face, at least you kind of know how to interact. This is a new medium for a lot of us. And so a lot of the students are gonna be interviewing differently. So I could see that being difficult. I don't see the medical schools not opening up. I, I, maybe one, maybe two, but it's just too important to our national security not to have these medical schools open. If we miss a year of students coming into our workforce, not only we're right now projected to be in eight years, 100 plus thousand short physicians, you tack out another 25,000 to that because that's our incoming class size, then, then you start talking a major problem eight, 10 years out because what we're doing right now is not for today, it's for five, six years from now. And so when we start talking about investments, we need to be thinking that far out into the future. With respect to the 2021 class intake, it could be more competitive. And that's because I think there are gonna be students who take time off. And I think to make yourself be competitive at that next application process, that's why you need to do a program like this master's program, or you need to do something other than just sit at home. The nice thing about us is that if it's going to be competitive, this is going to give you an advantage in that competitive market. But more importantly, when you go to medical school or you go to some other health profession school, it's going to put you above those other students in the level with which you're prepared. And to me, you're investing hundreds of thousands of dollars into, into these degrees. The better prepared you are, the better you're going to be in the long run. So it's money well spent on doing it. Does anyone else want to, Ken, uh, Dr. Dobbins, Dr. Torres, Dr. Rilarzam, anyone want to add on to that? I would, uh, this is uh, uh, Dr. Fernandez, I would agree with your view. Um, certainly, you know, there's a lot of uncertainty out there still of that, of this year and the coming year. I mean, if, uh, you know, if history serves us well uh, during the so-called Spanish flu uh, pandemic, uh, of 1918, there was a second shot of it once the fall hit again in the United States. So uh, is this current situation of COVID-19 gonna do the same? Well, we don't know, maybe, maybe not. There's still a lot of uncertainty there. Uh, so 
you know, there's a lot, it, the best thing you can do is, you know, what you can control, go ahead and control. That, that's really what you have in hand, that's what you can control. So go ahead and, you know, if, if it's too much stress, well, you know, I have this in hand, let me follow this, this pathway and see how other things are, are developing because there's way, you know, it's like uh, going back to baseball right there. You know, you have way too many situations going on right there. You know, here comes the pitch and you don't know what's coming. If it's a curveball, a changeup or a fastball. So, you Gotta know, like just, the baseball analogies. Yeah, just look for one pitch. <laughs> That's right. I, one of the things that I think is gonna be interesting is I, I think that because of what's happening right now, it's becoming more aware of the shortage of positions we have in our workforce. We see it in the news all the time, hospitals uh, talking about they can't have enough doctors in or nurses. We see hospitals in rural America. I mean, I talk about this quite a bit. Hospitals in rural America are closing because they can't get doctors to come work in. We need to solve this. And I think you're seeing a push now to open up more medical schools and more slots um, for the residency programs. And you're starting to see that slowly trick through, trickle through Congress. So maybe not next year, but the year after, I think you're gonna start seeing more availability for students to, to get a chance to go to medical school. Right. Dr. Renhan, one, one of the issues that I had mentioned before was the quality of delivering an academic program. And the manner in which we deliver, whether it's face-to-face -face or it's remote because we have to have uh, distance between individuals, um, it's going to be a quality, a quality program. And our faculty understand how the flipped classroom works, how the ICS works, and, and how we deliver uh, a quality program. And, and it was very easy and seamless for us to do that. So students should be thinking about, all right, what kind of program are, am I signing up for? And it's one that can get them through uh, a master's program and into med school. That's a good answer. Samir? Thank you guys. Yeah, I think I'd like to direct this next question. I think a really important one over to Dr. Ram Churin. And uh, really we've discussed a lot here folks about the importance of a quality application. And I can't stress that enough to people on the line. I myself have done admissions work for graduate school for a long time. And one of the things that folks normally don't consider is that when you apply to medical school, almost everyone's got pretty good grades. Almost everyone's got pretty good test scores. And, you know, if you're applying to medical school, you're already smarter than the average bear. And to really separate yourself, that application becomes increasingly important. And so, Dr. Ram Charon, could you tell us a little bit about um, what you're able to do to help students in your MSMS program? really develop their application, how you can really advise them on putting together a high quality application. Uh, could you talk a little bit about uh, the support that you're able to lend to students? Uh, sure. Uh, so I don't know if I should take offense to you calling me a bear. Uh, <laughs> uh, but I think at the end of the day, um, you know, we at the university here, we have a variety of mechanisms here through our academic student advising services that will meet with students to help, um, you know, sharpen their CVs, help help them strengthen their, their personal statements to medical school, um, uh, provide a personal statement to medical school that is well-rounded, that not only addresses the, their academic pursuits and their academic achievements, but also maybe some scholarly activity that they engaged in, also some community services that they engaged in, um, some publications that they may have had. Um, you know, with our program, you know, we, we really have uh, some faculty here at SCU as well that are going to be working with those learners uh, as a faculty advisors and tracking them along the way and giving them immediate timely feedback on things they can do to strengthen their application, strengthen their scores. Um, you know, maybe team up with one of our faculty that's currently working on something uh, in the sense of a publication and maybe these students could serve as a, a, a third or fourth author on a paper. So again, these, these examples will help separate you from your peers that are applying to medical school because again one most individuals that are applying will apply 
via a bachelor's degree, but now you're coming in with a master's degree that demonstrates that you could, um, that you understand rigor, that you're capable of a higher level degree and be successful at achieving a higher level degree, but then also, you know, you've maybe had some scholarly activity, you've done some community service. I mean, there's a lot of variables that the students can do along their one year trajectory in this MSMS that can help strengthen their application. Excellent. And would anyone else like to speak to that as well? Thank you, Dr. Ramchurin. Anyone else would like to speak to the student support services that are really key to making their program go well? I, I'll, I'll add just a little bit color to that. All the schools are gonna have some process to help you get your program together, whether it be the faculty or their advising sessions, because that, that's really what we do and help advise you on where that pathway should go. And it's really one of the great things about the MSMS program is we're gonna be able to tell you, in fact, I was just talking to a student in St. Louis um, before all this kind of happened. I said, she was saying, oh, I wasn't sure if I could get to med school. I'm like, look at you're predicted to get like a 230 on the step one score. You got to apply. I mean, you're, you're the type of student that needs to go and you're, you're, you're going to go back and practice in an area. She was telling me all about where she was from. And that's the advice we can start doing that you can't do if you're just doing something at home. If you're playing a video game or even if you're doing research or you're doing clinicals, which are important things to do. But going into these type of degrees gives you access, regardless of what school you go to, but it gives you access to professionals who understand this market and can help you get an opportunity in, in, and a job in this healthcare field, which we, which we need. We need you to get into that workforce. Thank you there, Dr. Lenahan. I, I want to be conscious of time here and, and wrap up uh, relatively soon. But before I do, I'd like to get to um, an important question that I'd like to ask Dr. Fernandez. Uh, a lot of people on the chat, Dr. Fernandez, are talking through the logistics of how they would ultimately matriculate to medical school in the fall of 2021. And so could you walk them through the process and the timeline of this MSMS program and when approximately the program starts, when it finishes, and when you would begin to support them in their medical school application? Right. So... The MSMS program and the medical school application, they, they go hand in hand. Uh, medical school application is not something that you can, uh, you know, rush in a couple of weeks. This is really, it, it's really a process. You're building up to it. Uh, so while the, let's say the student enrolls in the MSMS, uh, what we uh, do here at St. Thomas University with our faculty advisor for the program is we start working on the elements of the application pretty much right off the bat. We start looking, okay, have you done shadowing? Have you done clinicals? Uh, what We really work not so much on the scientific content. It's really the other part where the students are not as knowledgeable. Have you done research? Have you done community service? So because those are the areas when a, you write a personal statement that, you know, somebody like Dr. Lenny and I was going to look and say, oh, I like this one, first paragraph, great, and not throw away. So we really want to start working, we really start working with those students right off from the beginning, log in, create the account, as simple as that, because sometimes, remember, these students come from potentially a background where they have not seen a doctor, they may be the first one on their families that goes to college. And that's something really important that we have to understand. So we have to give an extra service, meaning this is, you know, create your account, this is your profile, and let's start building it up. And then really, if they took the MCAT, you know, re or need a retake of the MCAT, we also want to get, we got to get you enrolled in this. Uh, we've gone to the extent, and I, I did this for, for the one student, that the student told me, you know, my dad's out of job, I cannot pay for the MCAT. And I said, don't worry, we'll pay for it. You know, so, so there's things that you have to consider when you look at, at those students. And there are certainly some uh, steps that you really need the extra guidance. I mean, we're talking about students where they, 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 the only doctor they know is the one they go to. They don't have a family member that's a doctor or knows somebody in, in that regard. So there's always an extra hand holding if you want to picture it. 
but certainly it's important because that is the type of service that needs to be done to our students. Thank you, Dr. And I'll have us wrap up in a moment here. I'll turn over to Dr. Lenahan for some quick closing remarks, uh, but do want to address uh, the fact that we did not get to all of the questions in the chat box. And some of the questions in the chat box, almost all of them are still quite important. So I want to offer this to everyone who's still listening here, is that all of your questions are important. And what this group will do uh, is we will take these questions and any others that you would like to send us via email. I will list my email down at the bottom of this box here. We'll follow up with everybody and create a frequently asked questions page and send it around to this group so that you could all benefit from hearing those answers as well. Uh, but with that being said, I'll go ahead and type my email address into this chat box and I will turn it over to Dr. Lenahan for closing remarks. Thank you all. Well, I wanna say thank you to everyone that, that showed up and gave us an hour and a half a year day to listen to us. This problem we have in the healthcare workforce, the shortage, the need for qualified people willing to go into areas of need is of paramount importance. We see the problem when we don't make the investment as a society right now during this pandemic. We have to make sure that we get students like you into that pipeline to get you opportunities, to get you chances so that we can fill this healthcare demand that, that we're gonna have and, and, and need. So with that, I wanna thank everybody that's been on the interview, Dr. Dobbins, Dr. Nchurin, Dr. Larsdan, Dr. Torres, because it's their input that are gonna guide you through that process and you need a mentor. Do not try to do this on your own. You need someone to help you understand what it takes to do it, how you go about doing it and how you get there, whether or not you need help with the MCATs or you need help with your, your position statement, get some assistance. What I would recommend students to do is take a first step. Decide what you're gonna do and take that step. Make the application process. Do that today. Start writing your personal statement. Do that tomorrow. Make your application for the MSMS program. Do that today. You know, make some steps of what you want to do and then start doing it. And I think if you take that first step, a lot of that stress is gonna, is gonna dissipate. And what I would also say is take care of yourself. Not only be safe with your family and, and monitor yourself with respect to the quarantine, or you know, if you do go out, make sure you're using all your protective means necessary, but also get exercise, eat right, get good sleep, keep your stress levels under control because it's not only stressful for society, it's doubly stressful for you watching me right now because of what you're trying to do and make a career choice on. It's not fair. It really is not fair to all of you. And I wish I could give something to say, I wish it would be better. And I understand that that's not, you know, there isn't anything I can say, but you will get through it. You will be a better day tomorrow. We will be proceeding and, and, and you will have your career. You will have your life. It will be good. Just take that first step. And we're here to create opportunities. We're here to help you achieve that goal. Use us, reach out to us, contact us, and we'll help. And we look forward to seeing all of you in the fall in our master's program, whether it be in California, New Jersey, Florida, Chicago, St. Louis, Puerto Rico, or where it happens to be. I hope to meet, meet all of you in person. Be safe, have a great day, and thank you all for coming. And thank you, panel. I really appreciate you giving us your time. Thank you, David. You're welcome. Thank you.